This is a cry for help. All right, did anybody see I'm reporting? You would have to have no excuse voting some of those things to really make that work well. Often victims of civil rights violations can't sue. They don't have the resources to sue. They don't have the wherewithal to sue. Doing better uh, background checks and, and getting to know them before we give them a government badge. The dogs appear pretty even in cuteness, size, likability. Uh, this could go either way. Welcome everybody to season three of the Alad Pod. Very excited to have you all here today. Wherever you're watching from, let us know. Put it in the comments right now. And uh, want to give a shout out to Missouri's own XJ Will, aka Joshua Williams, for the wonderful beat at the beginning of this show. We are uh, going to talk about Missouri's Sunshine Law. That involves public records, uh, public access to those records, and there is no better guest for the show than Mark Pedroli, who's been uh, pushing this issue quite a bit in a lot of different ways, and today we're going to talk to him about the work that he's doing and about uh, where our state is going. Fun thing is, this upcoming week is actually Sunshine Week, so we'll be seeing a whole lot of stories in the local press here in Missouri about the importance of the Sunshine Law, why we have it, and where it's going, or at least the current state of it, too. So while you're watching, if you've got any questions, and I hope you do, go ahead and put them in the comments wherever you're watching from. We'll be able to see those and get them on here live as well, and hopefully answer as many of your questions. You'll also be able to see a, uh, you'll see a phone number during the show that will be on the screen, and you can text those questions to that number. Do not call that number because I'm not picking up at the middle of the show, but if you text it, I'll see it, and we'll get you some answers too. So go ahead, like this thing, share the video, make sure we can get a whole lot of folks talking about this very important issue about transparency and government accountability here in Missouri and really all across the country. So without any further ado, let me get our special guest today. Mark, are you there? I am. Hello, sir. Welcome to the Allod Pod. This is your first time on, surprisingly. First time on the Allod Pod, and I, it's my pleasure. I appreciate it. Yeah, very excited to have you. Um, so if you could, um, you know, I know I know some folks have been uh, following you quite a bit through the work that you're doing, both in the news and, and uh, on Twitter is a great spot to follow you to. But uh, if you could, let us know, you know, what, what, what do you do um, and, and what is your involvement right now with uh, Missouri Sunshine Law? So, well, I guess the best way to describe it is I have two jobs, my day job and my night job, probably a little bit like you. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, you know, Pajoli Law is my law firm. We handle litigation for a wide variety of things, uh, including some appellate work. And then uh, a few years ago, we launched the Sunshine and Government Accountability Project, which is dedicated to litigating cases of transparency. Um, so day job, civil rights work, uh, wrongful death work, uh, trial work. Um, and then the, the side project is the Sunshine and Government Accountability Project, where we bring litigation across the state against state entities, local entities, um, uh, alleging violations of the Sunshine Law. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, for, for folks who don't know, um, you know, Missouri's Sunshine Law and many other states, uh, these laws came to be, I actually got to meet the, uh, the wife of the uh, legislator who uh, pushed it very hard in uh, Missouri, but it came about after uh, Richard Nixon's presidency, and uh, there was a very big call for transparency in government. So when a lot of states, uh, they passed uh, local uh, sunshine laws or public records laws, you might hear these as a FOIA request. Uh, those are usually at the federal level, but some states have, uh, they actually do call them FOIA too. So every state has pretty much a different name for what these things are, um, but they're, they're all very similar in terms of their intent. In terms of their uh, administration yeah. and enforcement, it's a little bit different. <laughs> Um, so, so in Missouri, Missouri's attorney general is the one who's supposed to be in charge of enforcement of the Sunshine Law. That becomes a little bit of an issue, as we discovered, when the attorney general is the uh, the target of Sunshine requests and uh, or or you know political folks that that he's a fan of, and uh, that there doesn't seem to be much action in those those areas. But for for I guess for folk, you know, for in general for people, what what does the Sunshine Law? 
apply to? Is it is it everything in our government? Uh, what 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 are what is the uh, the goal of the Sunshine Law and making what what yeah. part of the government does it make transparent for folks? Right. So, well, you you raise an interesting distinction because the intent of the law, which was passed after the Nixon administration, was to uh, allow uh, residents of Missouri, well, anywhere really, to be able to have access to um, all government communications with certain exceptions uh, related to, you know, that are very strictly construed against the government, maybe related to litigation and that sort of thing. But generally, the idea was to allow people to see what was going on in the government, communications, emails, um, you know, communications with donors, uh, all types of things. Um, and the problem, obviously, with the administration of it is it seems that since the law was passed, the government has been at war with the Sunshine Law. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they don't want to give uh, the communications. They don't want to give uh, the information. It's difficult, and they've made it more difficult to do it. One of the biggest concerns now evolving out of the last few years, uh, importantly, is, you know, in Missouri, there's a distinction between the Sunshine Law and the Records Retention Law, which is another critical issue because, you know, there's an argument now that you that they don't need to even keep the records uh, for a certain amount of time or they could destroy the records. And the uh, if you live in Missouri and you're Missourian, you don't have a private right of action to bring a lawsuit to stop the destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a real concern. It's something we're litigating now. Um, and I think it's frankly a big hole in the Sunshine Law. Um, the Sunshine Law itself is Chapter 610. And that relates, well, arguably, to, to the production of documents they retain. Now, the question is, do they retain them? And where do they retain them? We've already heard about people going off government servers in order to enjoy, uh, you know, uh, uh, not getting a hit on a search mm -hmm. that somebody asked for. And then they don't produce those records either. So there's a lot of games. There's a lot of shenanigans going on inside of our government to prevent people from, from getting these uh, communications. Yeah, it, it's a really good point um, because if they don't have the record in the first place, they can't give you anything. So some right. of our officials on purpose do not have you know, yeah. a state email account or, or something else okay. because they don't want us to be able to ask for anything. But you actually, you dealt with something uh, that was a little bit different because if they have the records and then they start, you talked about retention schedules, but you, you dealt with an issue where they had the records, but they were doing it through uh, uh, these text deleting apps that would destroy those records. Um, and you've been, you've been litigating that in, in Missouri's courts as a result of that. Right. So true. So this, this, this is back to the Eric Wrighton days, the use of confide, which was an automatic burner app, but not the only one though. Mm -hmm. There were other apps that were being used. For example, the Missouri State Highway Patrol was using silent phone. And when we sent a request for the communications related to it, I expected to get, well, we have communications, but you can't have them for one reason or another. But the answer was, we don't have any. Mm -hmm. um, and when we researched that app, we found out that it self deletes after 90 days. So there, the use of these apps has been a tremendous problem, and it's a huge threat. There, there's, there's another case we looked into, which was in Long Beach, California, over the use of Tiger Text, where uh, police officers in Long Beach were using it to communicate with one another about what was happening you know, uh, at the department, and these also were immediately deleted. Um, so that's a, that's a major problem. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like I've said before, we don't have a problem with encrypted technology. We don't have a problem with people wanting to have encrypted communications. But if you're in the government, you have to keep it. You can't select an app that automatically destroys those communications. That violates Chapter 109. Right. The problem we had is, is when we realized that Governor Greitens was, in fact, and, and the people in his office were violating Chapter 109, the judge ruled that I couldn't bring a case to prevent it or even to enjoin it. The only person that had standing to do it was the attorney general. Well, <laughs> that's a problem, particularly when you have people that are in the same political party. If you have two Democrats, two Republicans, the chances of one enforcing on the other are going to be very slim. Right. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting because I mean, I you know, I've been litigating 
these cases for a bit too. And the argument always comes back from the other side is that, oh, well, it's the attorney general's job. The public mm-hmm. can't enforce this. And it's just, well, I mean, first of all, the law does allow us to. Uh, but second of all, you're exactly right. Like, what are we, what we have no, you're, what they're saying is we have no recourse to accessing public records that belong to the public if our attorney right. general doesn't really want to get involved. Uh, and right. he has been involved in some cases. I mean, there have been some, you know, some uh, 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 cases where he has investigated, he's been involved, and he's told folks, you know, Here's what you need to do with the Sunshine Law. Um, one issue uh, that we have seen um, recently, and one that uh, I was in court on, but you wrote a brief in support of it, is is when the government is saying, "Oh well, wait, look, you asked for records, we're going to give you the records, uh, but only if you pay us a whole bunch of money." Now, under the Sunshine Law and many other of the, you know, in a lot of states. They can charge you fees for copies or, you know, uh, uh, somebody, in, a clerk or a secretary looking up these records and going and get, for, okay. Uh, but they weren't just charging that. They were charging for an attorney to review all of these records so the government could decide whether they wanted to provide these to the public or whether they wanted to, to close them because it's up to them whether they wanted to do it. And, uh, I, you know, certainly I was charged and wasn't very happy with it. Uh, but we just saw recently, I don't know if you saw, this was uh, it, it, this this week, I think yesterday it just came out, that one of our state legislators, Representative Sarah Unsaker, had asked for records from, uh, fr- about the vaccine distributions and why the vaccines weren't going to certain places and others and just simply asked our government, you know, the agency that she's helping oversee, where are you sending vaccines? They wouldn't mm-hmm. respond. So she sends a sunshine request and then they charge her. They said they were going to charge her 40 plus dollars an hour for an attorney to review all of these records and another $20 per hour for somebody to make the copies and then 10 cents per copy that they made her. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's not just like you and me, uh, these, right. you know, attorneys or, or even members of the public who are asking this. Uh, there's also folks who are in our elected office who can't get access to these records apparently now. So. Yeah, that's and, and your case was a great case to bring, obviously, because it shows you once again the government by design, uh, you know, creating impediments to people getting documents. And the unfortunate part about charging the attorney's fees is there are some people that can afford that. Mm-hmm. Um, not, you know, but not many. And, you know, in, in newspapers, their budgets aren't that high. They can't, and particularly newspapers. Um, but just think about the average person at home. Um, who just wants to find out information and they send it to their mayor or their local official. And the local official says, look, this is going to cost you $350. They're never going to get it. They're never going to pay for it. And the thing is, is they know that. So th- these these impediments are created by design. I think our government should, well, they should have understood when the law was passed that there would be a cost. There's a cost to transparency. The government has to do this and provide to, and provide it. But that's you know, that, that's, that shouldn't be an issue. That should be something they support, um, spending mm-hmm. a little bit of resources in order to create a transparent government. What we have now, though, is the reverse. Um, they're going out of their way. They're creating new arguments, new legal justifications. And boy, they are getting more creative by the day, uh, to the stuff that they come up with to prevent access to records. A real problem, um, you know, and, and, and this, this touches on everything. I mean, transparency, uh, you know, it's 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 fundamental not only to democracy, but it's fundamental to civil rights. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fundamental to civil liberties. Um, you know, and frankly, both sides of the political spectrum have always been on the same, you know, side in this case when it comes to transparency. Unfortunately, though, in Missouri, the well, I would say the new and the younger group of Republicans have sort of turned against some of their old philosophies about transparency and civil liberties. That's concerning and, and it needs to be reversed. This should not be a partisan issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. And I, you think about what this, I mean, it applies to records from your own school board and, you know, transparency is is so important. I mean, just, just from some of the records that you and I have found, but not just, I mean, from years and years, this has been happening where folks have found records and it's been used to really, 
see what our government is doing, whether that's with our taxpayer money or with the institutions that we have or with their political office. Um, you know, I mean, there's just a lot that we're missing. And it's not just, you know, it's, I, we both are, are civil rights attorneys. And certainly, you know, a lot of those lawsuits are obviously against the government for doing something wrong to somebody and violating civil liberties in the Constitution. And when you do that, when you're asking for, you're looking for records from the government, oftentimes you're relying on the Sunshine Law. The same is very true um, for criminal, you know, in criminal defense, uh, for prosecutions, all of these things. Like this, this has such a big impact on our legal system, the thought, the idea, the concept of transparency. And you're, I mean, yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's very sad to see that um, there are folks who are willing to sacrifice that um, for some political gain or some, I mean, really just, you know, to protect themselves and maybe protect themselves from embarrassment or something else. I don't know, but that's the yeah, idea behind this. You're supposed to have transparency, so you don't want to do that kind of stuff. That's what I thought, I at least. But. I mean, I think that's what it's become, though. It's become a mm -hmm. protection of a person, and then it sort of snowballs from there. Because I don't know a lot of Republicans that really are against transparency. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them rank and file, I'm talking mm -hmm. about, not elected officials, hugely in favor of transparency, hugely in favor of keeping a check on the government to protect their civil liberties as well. So, I mean, it's like the one er area of agreement um, within both political parties. So watching this happen in Missouri in the last few years has been, you know, disappointing and, and strange uh, to see the efforts. I mean, <laughs> they spent uh, over $500,000, a half a million dollars to defend uh, Governor Greitens after he resigned mm -hmm. um, in the case regarding his phone when the governor, Governor Parsons, had an opportunity to come out and say, you know what, I think he violated the law. And we're not going to spend a half a million dollars of taxpayer money defending the destruction of government records on an app. So at every point in time, th these elected officials have had an opportunity to make a decision that stopped this sort of avalanche um, against the Sunshine Law and against transparency and protecting people's civil liberties and civil rights and knowing what the government is doing. And I just don't understand why mm -hmm. the decisions were made like they were. And unfortunately, I think it comes back to what you said. It may be just protecting a person uh, or they're afraid that the discovery and the litigation will lead to something that somebody else did that works, still that works in the governor's office or something like that. Right. They need right. to put an end to it. Though. They need to do something to turn this around. Yep. Yep. I absolutely agree. Um, before I get, because I know we're getting some questions out here. So if you do have them, folks, and you're watching, go ahead and put them in the comments. And I'm trying to monitor everywhere at the same time. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's interesting in Missouri to see, you know, there are a few of us attorneys who are doing a lot of work in this area. It always usually starts from some kind of story, right? There's like an origin story to how you became Sunshine Law sure. guy. Uh, you know, for me, it was, uh, uh, I mean, I just, I was looking into why Greitens was able to just trade in his job and not get convicted of anything uh, and why all the investigations stopped. So I asked for records from the governor about his communication, right? Not that our current governor, I asked our current right. governor for records of Eric Greitens talking to these 27 groups and individuals that were all connected with this dark money thing. And uh, they had 13,000. I couldn't believe they're ready, but there were 13,000 records around it. And so they wouldn't give it to me. They were charging for these attorney's fees. And now I've been in litigation for like three years on this issue. But what, for <laughs> you, where did it, where did it start? Because I, I know your story is pretty interesting. Where did you start to turn towards working on Missouri Sunshine Law? I haven't been asked this question in a while, but it actually sort of, it, it, it's, it's, it's it goes been back a while to the now. old theory. <laughs> All politics is local. Yeah. So for me, it started out locally. So we asked basically the, the mayor of a, a St. Louis County municipality um, for a trial transcript of a trial that the city was involved in. They had it, you know, on PDF. Uh, so they could have just emailed it, um, but they didn't because it was a hot topic and I guess, you know, certain people didn't want this information out. Um, so we sued. Um, I, was, I, I was just amazed, though, because I was thinking, how can they not give us a copy of a clearly public document? It's a trial transcript. Could anything be more public than that? Um, 
And the idea that they didn't give it was frustrating. And I thought, well, gee, do they think they could just say no and I'm not gonna do anything? I'm a lawyer, so we filed a lawsuit. Um, eventually that led to a whole, you know, uh, I would say a fairly big drama and it was in the pair. And uh, it led even to my plaintiff running for alderman. Um, this sort of fired everybody up and uh, he won. So it was really strange going from a position of being a plaintiff in that case and then having my plaintiff become uh, the alderman over, over, these, over this fight over records. So uh, it was an interesting beginning for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and you see, and that's the other thing. I, I, don't, I don't know, but just from a, a perspective, like a strategy perspective, if you're an elected official, and you're fighting really hard to hide records from the public, it's probably not going to look so good for you at your next election, especially local ones where you're kind of picking on just a couple issues. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you won. This. Well, then, of course, from there, we were in the middle of that litigation, right. and then the gripe story broke. But yeah. that's sort of when you and I started crossing paths uh, mm -hmm. a lot because th that was probably December of 2017 when yeah. we filed the, uh, the, the Greitens case. Um, alleging the use of confide was illegal. Uh, you know, then that snowballed. We have a, a suit against the House of Representatives. I think it may be the first one in Missouri history where the House has been sued uh, for not uh, uh, abiding by the new Constitution, uh, Constitutional Amendment Number One, and uh, that's currently pending. But then there's also the cases that you probably don't hear about as much. Like uh, my client uh, was shot uh, unarmed, and uh, you know he just sped away, and 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 he was. The, the police officers from Velda City were actually prosecuted um, in St. Louis County. We requested uh, the body cam and the dash cam of the shooting to see whether or not it was a legitimate shooting. And, you know, they just ignored the Sunshine request. So we had to file suit. Um, we ended up getting those records. Um, we, we also, you know, there's a lot of records related to civil rights cases in jails. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have a pending litigation right now against Polk County that not many people know about. That's where our current governor was once sheriff. So we had to sue the sheriff's department in Polk County in order to obtain video of a young man who was 33 years old, who uh, apparently had an asthma attack and died in that jail. So mm -hmm. they didn't give it to us. We had to sue. And I think we're going to get it very shortly. We've already actually been allowed access to it. So we've seen it ourselves, um, but they're not giving it to us, but I think they ultimately will because I think they have to under the Sunshine Law. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of these little things going on too, uh, you know, uh, so, sort of beneath the headlines um, that have to do with everyday cases and access to information. And these are the kinds of things that people need to know too, because the only way you're gonna reform mm -hmm. something that happens, let's say in a jail or in a police department is to see it. You have to, you have to know it, understand it and see it with your own eyes so that the people can, you know, try to reform it and address that. The problem that we, we see, and you and I see this every day, is that there will be that video that's damning for the government. They, they don't want it out. And they're going to try to negotiate and, and they'll do anything but get it out. But the problem is, is that it comes out eventually, right, in litigation three years later. So everyone is seeing the headline news is this is what happened three years ago. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. If we want to reform things now, and we want the political system to immediately redress what's happening now. We can't learn about it three years later. Yeah. Yeah. It... Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Thanks. Uh, it, I mean, it got, this stuff just takes so long. And especially when, you know, you have a disagreement on, you know, you, it's it's kind of surprising to me to some degree because, you know, I'll, I'll uh, we're, we're asking for, we'll talk about this in a little bit too, I'm sure, but we're asking for, um, records from uh, Missouri's attorney general that were related to communications with other attorneys general all across the country, and uh, right. that that seemed to see that they were coordinating on uh, some of this January sixth stuff at the Capitol, and even before that to to help out um, President Trump and planned what what would they do if he lost the election, as if they were supposed to then do something to defend him. I, anyway, there's a whole lot there, and we'll, we'll talk about that too, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's tremendous yeah. on the robo calls and, and, and who funded the robo calls and did they know about the robo calls? I personally find it hard to believe they didn't know. Yeah. How, how would they not have known 
that the association that they're sitting in on meetings with every week is not putting out robocalls to get people to go uh, to protest the Capitol on January 6th. So that's, and I'm, by the way, I'm very proud to be involved with you on that. That's our first joint venture that we've done that was, um, together. Yeah. And I think it's, a, you know, it's an absolutely big deal. Mm -hmm. It's an absolutely important topic. I would be surprised if there aren't subpoenas following up upon our sunshine requests, seeking some of that same information about the funding of, uh, of sort of this, you know, protest advocacy to get mm -hmm. people to go to the Capitol. But the other problem is what are they doing in the Missouri Attorney General's office doing this? Can you even imagine if a Democrat uh, Attorney General would, would be, you know, doing these, these kinds of activities if Obama had lost the election, <laughs> saying that we're gonna spend Missouri taxpayer dollars to help Obama after he loses? I mean, it, it would be hair on fire. People would say that's a, an illegal use of taxpayer money in Missouri. So it's trim, it's just watching the, I guess the willingness, like a frog in boiling water to to ignore this. And Republicans too, rank and file. Yeah. They need to be, they, 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 this is not what they want either because they realize this is not what an attorney general should be doing. And they don't want the next attorney general, a Democrat down the line to be doing the same thing. You need right. to hold the line. Right. Yeah. Um, so so for those of you who haven't been following as much, um, yeah, we'll just talk about it now. But, um, you know, Mark and I, we, we asked for uh, records from Missouri's attorney general. Uh, a, a, any communications they had with these two organizations, one of them is called the Republican Attorney General Association. That is a you know, national organization um, that does a lot of fundraising for Republican attorneys general and candidates for that office. Um, they, a whole bunch of stuff they do. Uh, there's also a Democratic version of this too, but the, the Republican one seems to have been a little active in some interesting things as we discovered. And then there is another organization that's called the Rule of Law Defense Fund, which is actually the dark money arm of RAGA. The Republican attorney. So it's a 501c4. For those of you who followed me and my little, you know, the whole work I've been doing on dark money, uh, you'll know that this is one of those organizations that is used to take in political donors. And then uh, you don't see the names of those donors because they never have to release it. So that's why these organizations mm -hmm. exist oftentimes as, you know, some kind of subsidiary to a bigger thing because that's where they're hiding mm -hmm. folks. So that latter organization called the Rule of Law defense fund put out a robocall recruiting mm -hmm. people to come to the quote-unquote stop the steal event at the capitol on january 6th and uh uh it put it put out this robocall and and so it it did people got you know recordings of this thing they said what in the world are attorneys general doing involved mm -hmm. in in this this kind of activity. And so, of course, all of them said, I don't know anything. And we happen to have, you know, the attorney general here in Missouri happens to be the vice chair of the Republican Attorneys General Association. So very involved, one of the biggest fundraisers for that organization. Oh, I don't know anything either. Uh, so we asked for records from the attorney general's office, um, you know, about the involvement there in communications. Now, I told Mark, I said, Mark, I don't think we're going to get anything because I, I used to work there and we were very explicitly told, hey, no political stuff because guess what? It's illegal in Missouri to use state resources for political activity. And so uh, Mark was like, well, let's do it anyway. I said, you know what? Yeah, let's do it anyway. And uh, we did. And we got 90 pages of records and we saw the communications, the meetings. They had 30 plus meetings at least since July of this last year up through Jan like a little bit after Jan, they even had a meeting on January 5th. Um, they had mm -hmm. senior staff members that taxpayers are paying for going to these mm -hmm. political meetings. They had one of them that was called the <laughs> War Games Summit, where they were planning yeah. on what to do if Trump lost, uh, including a session on election integrity. And as we all know, mm -hmm. state attorneys general all across the country that were part of this organization then started filing all of these baseless lawsuits that were thrown out of court. So we, we uncovered quite a bit, and now that has expanded into requests to a bunch of different states, which is why I now have experience making public records requests all over the place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is crazy to see, especially given that office's history yeah. with an yeah. attorney general 
who went to prison for this kind of stuff. William Webster, yeah, yeah. ninety three, I believe. Yeah, uh, and it was, it was. I think it was. You know, I don't know every detail of the case, but I think some of the allegations were, you know, fairly mundane compared to today. Mm -hmm. It was the use of photocopy machines uh, for for campaign flyers. I mean, imagine that compared to filing amicus briefs to prevent the certification of Pennsylvania's electors. Um, right. and, and, I, and I wanted to add as well to what you said, you know, this is an attorney general. And I, I don't know what uh, Eric Schmidt is doing. I don't know what he's thinking. Uh, to be involved in the way he was in this sort of Trump mania after the election. Um, it's disturbing that he would have used that kind of bad judgment to involve Missouri's uh, paid people to serve the campaign purposes of someone who had lost an election by challenging another state, uh, Pennsylvania and, and everybody else. So it isn't just that they were involved in the robocalls, they were leaders, core leaders, trying to prevent the certification of the election in other states. So in that sense, the Missouri Attorney General's office has been, I think, nothing short of a hotbed of, uh, of you know, pro-Trump uh, post-election uh, contesting of the results of the election. Mm -hmm. and, and again, is that is that how, you know, Missourians want our taxpayer dollars to be used uh, for the campaigns of others? And what would they have said had you know Obama lost, uh, and and something like that would have occurred? Um, so big problems, big issues. Um, I think these need to be addressed uh, in, a, in a very important and deliberate way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had we had a Democratic Attorney General in the state for 24 years before um, you know recently Republicans took over, and I mean we nobody wants the Attorney General to be involved in political stuff with our taxpayer money like this. Yeah. And especially when, like, I understand the attorney general themselves, like they are elected officials and they are oftentimes running on a party. I think they always do. And uh, I, you know, I can understand that like they are going to do some political stuff. Uh, but yeah. I mean, good. I can't even, I can't even imagine uh, what yeah. would have happened if when I was there, and I know that there's a lot of folks who, who used to be there back in the day too, but I mean, if mm -hmm. folks who were there as assistant attorneys general, the deputy attorney general, the solicitor general were actively involved yeah. with political groups and not just like on their own time, but actually during work yeah. hours on a regular basis that then yeah. influences the decisions that they are making as yeah. taxpayer paid staff. It's just, it's just crazy to me. I don't know. It boggles the mind. And I agree yeah. with you. They can do political ads. They can go on Fox News and they can talk about, you know, their politics yeah. and they can run for office. They're certainly entitled to do that. Um, and, and, and certainly Schmidt is as well. Um, but I think, you know, <laughs> they have gone way too far here. Uh, this They've crossed the line. And this line is not a line that people want crossed. Because once it's crossed, can we get back to it? And do they want this hyperpartisan future? where whoever is going to you know hold those offices are going to use it to the best of their abilities for campaign related purposes. I don't think that's the world either party wants to live in. Right. Um, at least the rank and file members of both parties. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, we can get some sense back into the system soon. Yep. I agree. And if you are interested, um, we've got a report that's up um, and you can read it. So if you'd like to see oh what are these records and you know, maybe I don't believe those two guys. You can read it for yourself and see exactly what it is. And it's up at uh, takebackmissouri.org. So you'll see that right below there. Takebackmo.org will get you there too. And if you do a backslash dark money or if you just follow the links on that website, it will get you there. But spend a lot of time on that darn thing. So hopefully uh, you read it and it helps. Yeah, I just, <laughs> that, that, these things take a long time. Well, you've, you've done, you've done, you have a tremendous amount of energy. You've done huge work here in this issue. I mean, you, you've done almost all the lifting. Uh, in regard to this issue, we I help you a little bit with the sunshine request, but beyond that, you have been uh, you know doing a lot of work. Well, you know, it's I, I for me at least, I think that this issue is so big that the more of us who are out there doing whatever we can, the better. And right. I think you're right. Like, I mean, it's you know, we I didn't anticipate that the lawsuit that I filed um, would end up at Missouri Supreme Court in a case that I would really, really like to cite for a whole bunch of different stuff, but I have to wait right now. Uh, and, you know, the same with you. Like, I mean, there, there are things you just don't expect to happen, and all of a sudden it's right there sitting in front of you, and now 
we're here fighting for public transparency in a very big way that will have huge ramifications on the state and hopefully for the better. So um, thank you. You know, what I'd love to, you know what I'd love to see you do next is to organize uh, other people like you in other states. Mm. Because I'm wondering, you know, is in Illinois or our, just various states, uh, are there folks doing what you're doing or even what I'm doing? Um, and are they getting together like you and I did on a joint venture? Um, and 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 uh, it'd be really interesting to know, um, yeah. organize them a lot, because I think that would be fun. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think uh, we've taken some steps there already because I do have, uh, I think it's a hundred and something volunteers from different states. Yeah. And there's actually a question in here. So Janice asked it early because it kind of applies here, but I'll put it on the page. Uh, is there such a thing as a class action sunshine request that all of us who sign on could show up in court with you? Well, just so you know, Janice, you could show up in court. Well, not right now. There's there's a virus going on, but eventually you could show up in court all the time. And in fact, on some of these early cases that I had, people were showing up from you know Jefferson City or they were coming sometimes to travel and, and help out too. And I had some wonderful volunteers who helped me carry in uh, loads and loads of statutory history that I was trying to prove up a case for. So I'm very appreciative of them doing that. But uh, you certainly can come in. I know that, um, you know, both of us have actually made requests on behalf of other people. I know, Mark, you've done that on behalf of me and this one that we're, we're talking about, um, too. It's all from a technical legal standpoint. So, sir, I mean, certainly you can have representation, but the class action thing, um, it's really, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like it's, I mean, it's not so necessary in this area because, um, I mean, you're kind of, the way the statute's already written, you're kind of fighting for public transparency anyway. Right. Yeah. I, I don't, uh, you know, look, you can submit a sunshine request on behalf of a class of people. Right. Um, you can probably list, you know, 15, 20 names of people who are interested in getting the information. I mean, I've done that before, but what, what regarding suing, um, I think the only chance, the only time that I saw the potential for a class action lawsuit was in how they were using or abusing the charges. And uh, for example, if they were charging people, let's say multiple newspapers and multiple residents mm. for something that was illegal to charge for, would they be open to a potential class suing to get that money back because of their incorrect interpretation of the law? Possibly, mm. um, possibly. But that's, I would, I would imagine, uh, the only yeah. uh, case that I would see a potential class. Right, right. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it's such, it's such an open thing that's created. It's, it's something that's created by a statute. So it's something that's written, and we have right. to try to follow those rules as much as possible. So, um, But, yeah, anybody can make a request. In Missouri, once you make a request, um, the government agency that you're making that has uh, three days, three business days to respond. So not including the weekends or anything. Um, and if you ever need, you know, help, uh, I've put up a lot of examples over the years now. So, uh, you know, copy paste. Mark's got some good ones. I've stolen some stuff from him too. But uh, yeah, it's um, and actually some my some of my requests over the years as a result of court decisions and everything else have changed too. So um, definitely something to keep up on. But uh, Janice, Everybody else, you're always welcome to show up in court for us. So happy to have you. Right. Uh, and I'll just add, occasionally there's a case or two where you do have a lot of people that want to become plaintiffs mm -hmm. or want to get involved. Um, for example, the St. Louis City Airport privatization litigation, which I, you know, I'd obviously have to mention here because it was it's, a, right. it's still ongoing. And it's such, an, again, another example of the importance of transparency. I mean, could anything be more important than, than that? We're talking about a fairly secretive process that I think was started uh, in violation of the city charter in order to privatize an airport um, and, and having it initiated and, and, under, and undergone for over three years without the Board of Aldermen even uh, voting to begin the process raises a lot of serious questions about the balance of power and authority and who has it. I mean, obviously, this is, you know, we're in the age of privatization globally. Uh, nationwide, there are a lot of people with a lot of money that's being pumped, you know, into the system, who want to go buy assets and to turn that into cash flow for themselves. And so it does put these type of assets, you know, on the line. And whether you agree or disagree with privatization, the one thing again that everyone can agree on that it's done in a transparent manner. So that's been important. I think, you know, frankly, the 
the the lack of transparent lack of transparency and the need for transparency in that process probably ended up dooming it um, because it it didn't ha- there wasn't enough credibility. Uh, the people in the city didn't believe that the process uh, was credible at that point, and and it was killed. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. I mean, I had a, a a buddy of mine who's been involved in Missouri politics for a long time, and uh, he uh, he worked with um, actually Republicans, and he uh, he told me, uh, "Good governance is good politics," but that's not always true <laughs> the other way around. I mean, it just doesn't, you know, you are, you are inviting distrust when you do mm-hmm. these things closed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly the, the trying to privatize Lambert, I mean, that's just, and what we just got, didn't we just get something over the airport? Didn't some new airline just come in too? I mean, oh, I thought that the whole thing was doing too well, but apparently we're doing just fine. And the, so. way, and the way that it was done too, I think a lot of people, yeah. it just, it seemed, oh, it just seemed kind of, uh, cartoonish. That yeah. a billionaire would come in and fund uh, th- the entire thing and pay all of these consultants. It was just so unusual um, to begin with that this was being done in the manner it was being done. So, I mean, how it was even initiated, uh, I think, was led to a lot of distrust. And that distrust led for a lot of, you know, <laughs> need for transparency. And, you know, we just wanted records. We wanted to find out what was going on internally in the meetings. They didn't give it to us. Um, we sued. Um I feel very strongly we're going to win that case and they're going to know that in the future they can't do that again. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what a lot of these are doing. I mean, it's just basically saying this can't happen again because now there's some precedent that's out there. That's where a lot of these folks are living. These government agencies, a lot of them are living in the place where they know that most folks aren't going to take them to court. Most folks don't have, um, you know, the, the, the time or the education or the access to a court um, or even the knowledge on, on kind of, I mean, you know, not everybody specializes in sunshine law stuff. So there's a whole lot of attorneys who are probably asking for stuff and they aren't so sure about what to do either. And so they are taking advantage of that to then put up, you know, some kind of a barrier, even if they mm-hmm. might know, well, maybe this isn't the most legit thing in the world and hoping that people just go away because oftentimes, yeah. most, most often they do. Ugh. Yeah, I a hundred percent. I hear from lawyers all the time. To your point about other lawyers that that yep. that don't get documents, and they call me and to, to find out how. And so it's not like everyone knows how to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know lawyers that, that aren't getting these documents and that don't do it. So yep. it is it is fairly specialized, um, and the government knows that, mm-hmm. um, and they use that to their advantage when they see you know you you come along or me come along. They're worried because they know they're gonna. They might get sued, but unfortunately, it needs to yeah. be more than that, right? It does. It can't just be. Oh God, you know, a lot of sent a request. We're gonna get sued, goes. or Pajoli yeah. sent a request. We're gonna get yeah. sued. Um, it has to be. You know, they they need more fear that they're gonna get sued, and they need more fear that they're gonna have to pay mm-hmm. uh, for the attorney's fees of the plaintiff. Which you know, we could argue about that. Supreme Court case a long time ago because the Missouri Supreme Court argued with themselves um, about that. Um, but the, the rule should be that when the government loses, the government pays for the price that the plaintiff had to pay to get those records. Right. Yeah. Then they would produce all of the records you ever needed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the other problem. I mean, it's not like any attorneys are, are getting wealthy off of these cases at all. Yeah. Most of the time you get there, even when you get a great decision, it's like, yeah, yeah, these records are open. But you know what? We don't think that the government should pay you or for your costs, all of these years of litigation. You know, thank you for your service. And it's just like, well, that's that's why there's only a few of us doing this. I think. Well, and the fines are very limited, too, between they $1,000 are. and $5,000, yeah. yeah. then attorney's fees. So you're right. No, no one is doing this to be, even if they change the law, yeah. lawyers would not do this to make the money. Right. Um, but it would have an effect on the government saying no, because they they wouldn't want to pay maybe 50 different lawyers, you mm-hmm. know, their fees over a, a year period. Because after a, t- a little bit of time, maybe that adds up mm-hmm. and they start changing the way they approach, uh, you know, their responses. Right, right. That's the idea. Um, let's see. Oh, we got a good question here from Audrey. Kind of historically, um, this is interesting. 
because it is a little different now. So uh, about the Sunshine Law and uh, the use of emails and texting now, um, I mean, that it, it is pretty different hmm. because at a, t- at a time, I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't the pr- a very prevalent method of communication, especially when this thing first passed in the 70s. Um, and now, I mean, you even see in, uh, in our law, like they've tried to change it a little bit to include electronic forms of communication. But one of the things, um, you know, that, that is different now, I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to search for mm-hmm. records because so many of them are electronic. It's a lot easier to store them without destroying them. It's a lot easier. I mean, we have uh, uh, one of our state officials, um, the state auditor, she's put up a bunch of, like every time that somebody sends her a sunshine request, she responds and then she publishes all of those records online. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that we can do with the technology now, but at least in the, in the case that I'm arguing, um, the government... Uh, wasn't really trying to make a distinction between electronic records and paper records, but that kind of came up mm-hmm. in court. So that issue yeah. is is there. Um, and actually, I think at the Supreme Court, that was kind of in my favor, that argument. Um, mm-hmm. So if you can listen, all that stuff is online too. But it is interesting now that because so much, so much of this stuff is electronic, you would really think that we would have seen more transparency, but really we're seeing a whole lot of barriers that are put up to that. I guess they're they're innovating as much as the rest of us are, right? It's what well, your your big point is it's easier to produce. In most cases, when we our request we sent was just for URLs that they mm-hmm. type into the, the computer. I mean, how hard is that? That's very simple. Right. Um I've had some outstanding requests for you know, like one email or uh and, and I've had to wait three months mm-hmm. uh in some cases or to, to even get a response to that. That doesn't make sense. So being electronic makes it easier and cheaper to produce. They used to have to go to the boxes, right? In the attic and mm-hmm. the basements and go through all the documents to produce them. And you know that was not as easy, but it also makes it easier to evade. Um, yeah. It makes it easier to delete. Uh, you have text apps. So it's it goes both ways and uh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, definitely a lot of developments. And I mean, there's going to be a lot more stuff as, as, I mean, we're not done with texting and emails. I'm sure we'll figure out some other way to send a brain pattern over to somebody. But yeah, I mean, all this stuff is going to keep coming up. And uh, oftentimes, statutes don't really keep up. And this is true in a lot of fields. They don't really keep up as well with technology. Right. And so we do have to get to a point where we sit down and say, hey, and I, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I do think that we... We certainly could use a good look at Missouri Sunshine Law to make that thing uh, a little clearer and yeah. uh, certainly more favorable, I think, you know, in the way, in, just in, in like what the intent was behind it to keep these records open to the public. Um, well, I have an idea for you. Oh, here we go. So <laughs> it's it's pretty likely that the, uh, the confide issue is going to be appealed. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's going to end up in the Western District. So how about you get involved and maybe do a uh, an amicus brief on the issue of technology and on the issue of whether or not um, uh, the uh, people of Missouri have a private right of action to prevent the government from burning the records? Because again, and I said this in oral argument um, in Cole County, um, by saying we don't, that that means that the governor of the state of Missouri can literally walk outside of the governor's mansion with a banker's box mm-hmm. full of his letters that about public stuff. In the last year, he could light it on fire. And you, right in front of the, the media, he could just burn it. And you would not have, a, currently in Cole County, you wouldn't have a right to prevent that. The only person that would, would be the guy he appointed to the attorney generalship, mm-hmm. Eric Schmidt. And so far, when all of these issues have come up and, and, and really been in the headlines, right? Every day for weeks and months, they didn't step in. Um, they, they didn't do anything. When the attorney general found out that, you know, that, that the governor's office was using a silent phone after they got caught using Confide, again, they didn't step in. Um, they didn't say you have an obligation to keep the records that you're using on silent phone. So nothing was done. Nothing is ever done. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, there's an interesting... <laughs> Not to depress you. Uh, I know, right? It's just like, oh. Uh, you know, there's, but there's, so when I was doing research for the Supreme, so when, w- for those of you who haven't argued at Missouri Supreme Court, first of all, uh, very nerve wracking. Second of all, it's very yeah. different when you do it online than when you do it, um, when you do it in person. 
uh, because you can, you know, you kind of see some stuff and, and your computer's on, you turn your screen off. It, it's just, it's pretty different. But uh, I did a lot of research for that. And, and one, I remember reading like a whole bunch of law articles and there was a proposal by um, Gene Manneke and some other folks too. And this is something I've been thinking about a whole lot and was very happy to see this written about too. But Gene Manneke's, uh, um, she's in the Kansas City area. She's been working on these issues forever with the Missouri Press Association. Very knowledgeable about this stuff. And she proposed, instead of having uh, necessarily the attorney general who's responsible for all of this stuff, maybe having a separate person, in a, a government ombudsman, who is hopefully less partisan, because then you'll have a bunch of other trouble already, but that, that would be somebody separate who is is doing a lot of this sunshine law enforcement. I suppose you probably have to have either some rule that all of their records are always open, which you could do. I mean, you just put everything online and that way nobody really has to enforce anything on them because they it's already right. there. Um, or I guess you could have, you know, some kind of reciprocal uh, enforcement or something. But I, I don't know. I think, I think looking at some of these reforms would be a great idea. And as to your amicus request, you had me on the spot, but you know I'd do that anyway. I'd love to do it. So <laughs> happy to. You got me. Sign me up. Uh, <laughs> Let's. <laughs> uh, somebody asked about Sarah Unsicker's options. For those of you who, who tuned in a little bit later, um, Representative Unsicker had asked for records from uh, uh, Department of Health and Senior Services regarding vaccines and where they were being distributed to. Her and actually several other state representatives asked for those records. They weren't being provided. This was just in the, uh, the Missouri Independent um, the other day. So take a look at that that article, and we'll put that in the links or something too. But uh, she, she they they were not being provided with those records, and so the Sunshine Law does require at least some kind of you know initial response within three days. So she made that request, and they respond to her, and they decide to charge her just like they charged me a whole ton of money, uh, attorneys mm-hmm. fees, all of this stuff for her to review. Um, her options were uh, go ahead and pay that and try to get those mm-hmm. records. Um, hope that uh, somebody would listen to her as a state representative, which wasn't happening, or to sue them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, we talk about like, oh, well, Pedroli or, or, or a lot's coming to town. Uh, you know, uh, so I, I have, uh, so, so far it appears that I am three for three on tweeting something about these kinds of issues and then having a government agency call up an elected official pretty soon after that. So hopefully that mm-hmm. will be resolved. Uh, but we'll we'll find out. But yeah, that that would be unfortunately if you're not even in that kind of a position, um, oftentimes yeah. your only recourse is to talk to somebody and hope that one of your elected officials responds uh, or yeah. take these people to court. And uh, you know, ideally, some of the decisions that we're going to get will help everybody, so they won't be doing this as much to folks. But uh, that's that's been the recourse. It's, so hard, far. it's hard to believe that a legislative official can't that's get crazy. records for free. Yeah. I mean, you would imagine the legislature would pass a law saying that at least they get records from other agencies and uh, state officials for free. Um, so the, the idea that they don't even have that or support their own authority in that manner is strange. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, it shows the problems we and the dysfunctions that we have in the state. I mean, this obviously they can subpoena it, but they're not because you know you need, I suppose, to have a majority to be able to subpoena these records. And again, it raises this this question of, are we going to have any oversight in the state of Missouri if one party or another has a super majority? I mean, isn't that, that sh- and, I, and I would imagine that would bother everyone, again, rank and file people from both parties. You want oversight. You want to keep your own party clean as well. Um, it's not just about fighting the other party. And unfortunately, in this age of you know, hyper-partisanship, it, it, people just want to win um, and they yeah. want to beat maybe the other party instead of wanting to, uh, you know, reform both to keep both clean and to keep the government clean and, and to keep them watching each other well. So and, and in Missouri, we have that supermajority. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a lot of oversight in these areas because they don't want to step on each other's toes and hurt each other's feelings for political reasons. That's a problem. Right. Yep. Very big problem. And uh you know, I mean, it's, it's what you get when uh, you don't have much balance in government. It's just there's not as much accountability there. There's not as much of an ability for government officials to hold each other accountable. 
Um, but what, right. what was nice, and I will say this for, for the story, and I think Ellen, Ellen actually linked it in the comments too, so if you're watching live now, you can check that out. Uh, but um, there were Republicans who very much supported getting answers to these questions. So uh, that's mm-hmm. when you know some things will start to happen, especially in Missouri's mm-hmm. legislature. Uh, but I, I, it just goes back to what we've been discussing this whole time. Transparency is not a partisan issue uh, unless mm-hmm. you're, you know, I guess it's a power issue. So if you've got a whole lot of it and you don't like folks asking a lot of questions about it, uh, then you have issues probably, probably no matter what party you're in. But in Missouri, right. you know, this is where we live. And right now there's it's one party rule. And uh, that's that's the the party where all this stuff follows because that's they're the ones in charge. But um, it's, yeah, certainly on a statewide basis. And, but, and then locally you have you know, maybe the reverse sometimes yep. in St. Louis County. And, 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 and then and I sympathize then with the minority there that wants to at least get information uh, to some degree. Right. Not that I you know, sympathize politically you know, <laughs> one way or the other necessarily, but yeah. um, you, you understand. And I have Republicans call me <laughs> asking, what do I do to get this information? Because they want it too. Um, and they think everyone should have access to it. And they're huge supporters of the Sunshine Law mm-hmm. in St. Louis County uh, locally. So it, it, again, I scratch my head over the, the what's going on in Jefferson City and why these state representatives particularly yeah. are just walking away from this issue and trying to pass laws to weaken the Sunshine Law even further. Yeah, yeah. That's, Isn't it? That's, it's amazing. That makes no, I mean, hopefully as people realize what the problem is and that it touches upon them and that they experience it, maybe their ideas change a bit. But yeah, I mean, just... Uh, uh, not long ago, I had to do a whole lot of talking on the phone with some folks in Jefferson City to make sure they weren't going to pass uh, basically a nullification of Missouri Sunshine Law. And right. uh, yeah, I've, it's, it's as ridiculous. did I. I yeah. yeah. And we're sitting here playing defense. Yeah. And it's amazing. And there's just a few of us that, that would even make those calls. And, uh, you know, and the opposition party would do that too. Mm-hmm. But it, when there is that lack, like a balance of power, I really do think it comes down to a private right of action, right? Yeah. The only thing that protects minorities uh, generally is the United States Constitution, the state mm-hmm. constitution, and the private right of action. Um, without those things, there there isn't protection for the minority or even the political minority in each state. So I think as long, and, and while I agree with Gene that having these you know s- super entities would, would be interesting and it would be nice, um, and I think it ought to be looked into for sure, Nothing beats a private right of action. Um, mm-hmm. When you have that, um, and, and fee shifting, of course, where the government has to pay to the, at least the plaintiff for the cost that they had to incur, that's it. That's all you need. That's Then it works. You just put it in the system, and then it ends up getting all the documents and all the transparency you need. Yeah. So it's how it's structured, and that's what's damaging about what they're doing to the, the Sunshine Law now and transparency across the board is they're trying to Go in and find that one thing to turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I got an interesting question uh, from uh, Phelps County on the phone, and uh, as we're coming to a close here, but one of the questions, uh, the question was about asking for records from a government entity, but I guess being worried about what the repercussions would be if you ask for those records. Like, is there's not really a way uh, to hide the fact that you're asking for these records because that's the, I mean, they're going to know. Like the, the request is coming through. You could do it with an attorney or through somebody else. So they might not know, you know, who it is that's doing it. But um, I mean, that's that's an issue with some of this stuff, especially in um, some of the smaller towns uh, where folks are worried about doing that because they don't want to piss somebody off and then have, you know, some kind of, uh, um, you know, some kind of great retaliation point. back on them for that, for that too. So it, it's, it's a great question. It's a great point. It's something yep. I've thought about a great deal. It's actually one of the things we're thinking about doing at the Sunshine and Government Accountability Project is to make anonymous requests mm. on behalf of people. Um, we don't have to tell uh, the government entity who we're requesting the records for. Yeah. So we, we are arguably any, any lawyer or any person, right. You know, I mean, I, I guess to make it easy, they could find someone that they know somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And have that person ask for the records. That's one way to do it. Um, the other way to do it is to anonymously request what, the records. But yeah, that's an that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm glad that was asked because mm-hmm. it's something I thought about recently too. Because I, I I've had that conversation before with someone who didn't want to be the the person 
because they didn't want that local official knowing it was them who was seeking the records. Right. Yep. Right. Well, folks, uh, we made it to two. Man, this is good. Like, we could talk for another three hours about this stuff, um, but we won't. Not today. But I'm sure we're going to have some pretty significant updates uh, pretty soon. Um, I know that I've been talking a little bit about um, what our next steps are with uh, our current attorney general. He actually just denied another Sunshine request uh, because he didn't mm -hmm. want to reveal records about uh, what, where he was searching and where he found these records that he gave us in the first place. And the reason mm -hmm. was because uh, he used uh, the litigation exception, uh, <laughs> which essentially to me seems like he's pleading the fifth but using the Sunshine Law to do it. It's kind of crazy, but... Uh, there's a lot going on. So, Mark, I want to give you some time, uh, you know, here. Any closing thoughts, any things that folks should be looking out for for the work that you're doing right now? Um, well, <laughs> uh, sure. A lot, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, there's, there's a lot to say there. We, we, we continue to push um, on, across the board on civil rights issues, um, you know, wrongful deaths in jails. Um, uh, essentially, any we're, we're, usually where the government is, the defendant that's sort of developed as, you know, our niche, at least at Pedroli Law, and also the Sunshine and Government Accountability Project, getting the documents, you know, getting the tape recordings, getting all of this information. We're constantly in litigation. We, you know, we'll have updates on, on how these go. Uh, there are some cases that are probably going to end up at the Court of Appeals that I think is really interesting. And I think it's really going to answer the question finally in Missouri about how we're going to adapt uh, the Sunshine Law and the retention rules, uh, importantly, which is separate, uh, to modern technology. Uh, so I would imagine we're going to have some, you know, news on that in the next uh, few months. Yeah, yeah. Well, keep a tune out. We'll 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 bring you back. We'll have a good time with this. I think uh, it's important because really, just like you said, the private right of action is so important, and people need to know that they have that right. And uh, it's it's important to have fun. And I mean, the work that you're doing, and you know um, how seriously I take issues within our justice system because it's not working very well. Sunshine Law right. requests around, like transparency around those issues in particular are so important. So thank you so much for doing that work. Uh, I know I really appreciate it. I know your clients really do. I know everybody here does. Um, so thanks for doing it. I'm going to put up your website. So if anybody needs to get in contact with you, it's pedrolilaw.com. Uh, his Twitter handle was on there. I'll put him, look, all, all him by himself on the screen. If you look at the bottom right side, you'll see it. It's just his name, guys. It's at Mark Pedroli. You'll find him. He's up there on the I Twitter. I don't have a book to sell. Good stuff. What's that? I said, I, I need a book to sell. <laughs> you need something. I mean, come on. That's all right. I don't, have a, put I don't have a movie. I mean, come on, Alad. Let's let's get it going here. All right. Well, you know what? I'll, yeah, I don't know hey, who to talk a, to a, about a, that. A, but. Like a documentary. Maybe you, you know, it, that'd be fun. Who would play you? <laughs> well, we could play each other. It's a documentary. We could. We could do that. We could just flip it. Yeah, that would be great. Or I could play you and you can play me. That would be really. That's Yeah, that, that would be fun. Out. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and no one would know. <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll do. Well, folks. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that we could do. I, there's I, so I, much. I, yeah. So I, I appreciate what you do, too. I You know, um, and and. I look forward to doing uh, more things with you in the future. That's for yep. sure. We got Keep a lot of work hard to do, work. for sure. Keep up the good work. Yeah, you too, sir. Well, and uh, for everybody, if you're looking for that report too, I put it up earlier, but it's at takebackmo.org uh, so you can see what our kind of work is leading to. And uh, if you've got any more questions, you can go ahead and put them in the comments. We'll check that as well. Uh, hit them up on Twitter, Mark Pedroli. And uh, we will see you next week. We will have uh, my friend Renee from COPE24, which does a lot of education work around the state, especially with um, uh, young adults and teenagers around parenting skills and, and uh, uh, some emotional learning and stuff, too. So that she'll be great. Uh, wonderful speaker. So we'll have her on. And as always, you can find us anytime at aladgross.live. And you can subscribe to the podcast that will be coming out shortly wherever you subscribe. All right, folks. See you next time. Thanks for coming.